They used to be in Pampit on the mainland. Go in the house and take a hot shower, stop at McDonald's and get something to eat. Over here, you gotta catch it yourself or dig it yourself. One thing that people should know about having a bay house. Oh, we're so happy, we're ready to the fun. Wait, we promise we'll take baths. That we're the luckiest family alive. We really are. It's quite a nice backyard, right? <laughs> the happiest times of my life were and still are at the house. Playing with toy boats, fishing, clamming. I can remember clamming when I was three. The bay houses began out of a dependent relationship between farmers and fishermen. Back in the colonial days, farmers needed something to feed their livestock because the ground was covered with snow. And they saw that the salt hay that was growing on the marshlands in the bay had a particular kind of hay that wasn't covered with snow. So the farmers would pay the fishermen to go out there, row out there, and then come back. The fishermen said, gee, if I had a little house or a little shack that I could stay in, maybe overnight I could do some clamming, I could do some oystering, and also cut the salté. And that's how the first bay houses came to be. With the passage of the Volstead Act in 1917, many of the bay house owners quickly learned that they could probably make a lot of money by ferrying booze that was docked just offshore, very quietly at night, you know, go out there and bring in a case of booze or two, sometimes bring it to one of the marshland hotels, and sometimes bring it straight to shore where there would have been cars waiting for them. Supposedly per acre, there's more diversity and more life in this type of environment than any place else in the world. It's very peaceful, very quiet. You do hear the lapping of the water against the dock. And if it's high tide and you have to go to the bathroom, just be careful when you step out because you're going to step into the water. After World War II, 20 or 30 bay houses go into 300, maybe even 400. The fire, Sandy, and other different things, the the population of the bay houses uh, is now running around 30. Sandy Head, and we, I thought for sure the house wouldn't be here. So I came on the north end of the island, so when I get, went through this bridge, it would only be a few seconds of pain if it was gone. And when we hit the bridge, it's amazing, my boys were in the front, they would jump and dance and high five and the house was there. The sad part was there were three houses that were north of me that weren't there, gone, just disappeared like it was never there. After Sandy, I went in there and I sat in the old kitchen table. I sat there and I, I can't describe it, but I felt almost like spirit, electricity, energy, I, I don't know, but it was like, okay, fix it now. Okay, we, we gave it to you and it's a mess. Figure out how to make it work. We have lots of friends that say, don't you worry about losing your bay house. I never really worry about it because if something goes wrong, I'll just fix it. You grow up out here, it gets into your blood and you really don't want to let it go. So fortunately my nieces are following through with the family tradition. Whatever our first memories are in life, include the Bay House. This house has like a spirit to it. It has so much story, so much family tradition built in it. It's not just a house. It's not just a vacation spot for us. And it's not just wood put up. It's, it's everything to us. It's um, a part of Long Island that unless this is preserved, you're never gonna see anything like this again. Once these houses are gone, they're gone. I'm not a religious person by any means, but I tell people, this is my church, this is my happy place, this is my home. I'll be 48 in June. Every year of my life, I've watched that sunset in the same spot, and it's the most beautiful sunset you could ever see.